Okay, uh, a warm welcome to all of you joining this uh, Gobeshina Global Conference, fourth uh, monitoring locally led adaptation and resilience. And here today we are in a, a very exciting session uh, on Asia Pacific Re Resilience Empowering Local Solution Together. It's jointly organized by APN, Asia Pacific Network for Global Research Change Research, and Institute for Global uh, environmental strategies. And we are also joined by the uh, 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 distinguished panel. Uh, 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 and of course, they are also the part of the co collaborator in this or co organizing this session. So, Dr. Dipende, Chair of Research and Planning, South Asian Forum for Environment, uh, SAFE, in short. Dr. Chi Huyen Trong, Dr. Sachi, so he's a coordinator of Himalayan University Consortium, Secretariat of International Center for Ma Integrated Mountain Development. And then we have uh, Professor Ho Nok Song. So uh, he is a deputy dean of forestry uh, at Thai Nguyen University of Agriculture and Forestry. And we are also joined by Mr. Suman Basnet, a regional director, Asia Pacific. Uh, at the World uh, Association of Community Radio Broadcaster, Asia Pacific. And we are also joined by Mr. Osamu Mizuno, Program Director of Adaptation and Water Area of Institute for IGS, Institute for Global Environmental Strategies. And myself being uh, Bine, Bine Rasibagoti, your moderator. And also we have uh, Dr. Linda and Stephen Chen. So he's Program Director and Secretariat at Asia Pacific Network for Global Change Research. So uh, basically today in our session, we will be discussing about how we empower local solution together. So our idea is basically how we institute the monitoring of locally led adaptation or adaptation initiative. Uh, second, how we can capitalize, how we could capitalize through cross learning in order to achieve transformative adaptation from the, at the local level. So across the local level. So without uh, further ado, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Osama Mizinu, uh, Program Director of ICS, uh, for his uh, welcome remarks. Over to you, Mizinu san. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. A very warm welcome to all distinguished speakers, panelists, and participants. I'm thankful to all of you for attending this session, Asia Pacific Resilience, Empowering Locally, Local Solutions Together. At this fourth Governor Global Conference with its theme, Monitoring Locally Data Adaptation, or LLA, and Resilience, hosted by International Center for Climate Change and Development, or ICCCAD, and the Independent University of Bangladesh. IGES is very delighted to connect and contribute with this important event since the first Governor Global Conference. We are very grateful to the organizers for providing this opportunity. Taking this moment, moment, let me also share deep condolences of passing of Professor Salim, a global pioneer on LLA and loss and damage, and a close friend of IGES. We all miss him a lot. IGES has been promoting research, cooperation, policy discussions, and on the ground implementation on both climate adaptation and mitigation with international organizations, governments, local governments, research institutions, business sectors, non-governmental organizations, and citizens. Through this session, I just expect to learn new insights and experiences for co-designing and co-implementing effective mode of capacity building to promote LAD actions and innovations. With the help of our knowledge partners and key network, I just hopes to contribute local level capacity building by mobilizing the, the Asia Pacific Adaptation Platform, or APPLAT, which was launched by the Japanese government at the G20 summit in 2019. I hope interesting discussion will take place and the outcomes will be a good stepping, a stepping, stop, a stepping uh, uh, step to further promote the agenda of capacity building for locally led adaptation innovations among other partners and 
unleash the potential of LLA to trigger, to trigger transformative adaptation. I would like to, again, thank all speakers and uh, participants for taking time out of their busy schedule to attend this session. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mizuno-san, uh, for your uh, welcome remarks. We really appreciate your uh, participation today and for the welcome remarks. So let me just uh, give you a brief overview of our today's session. So today's session is uh, very simple. Uh, we, have a, we will have a presentation and followed by a panel discussion. And before that, uh, we have also created a small Jamboard in order to have all the participants atten uh, attending today's session to provide their insights. Uh, as we move on to the discussion, I have already included the link of the Jamboard. So please feel free to, there are like the three, three slides, two slides asking some your viewpoint and the final slides on the question and feedback about this session. So please, uh, while you are uh, 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 listening to the presentation, please feel free to indulge and provide your valuable insights and comments in the Jamboard. So we really appreciate that and it is really helpful. So in that respect, so without any further ado, I would like to first uh, invite uh, Professor, uh, Dr. Dipayan Day. He's a chair of research and planning of SAFE. Um, so over to you, uh, uh, Dr. Dipayan. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Vinay. Uh, I think I'm audible. You can hear me well. Yeah, very well. Good. Yeah. Good. Thank, you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Linda, uh, IGES, uh, APN, and especially uh, ICAD uh, for this opportunity to speak on this very important topic, I think. And uh, I, I remember in, in COP also, we were uh, talking and discussing about the locally led adaptations. So I will just try to connect my speech, my uh, I mean uh, talk with the field level experiences, the challenges, the constraints that we are facing all over South Asia. And uh, uh, if I'm allowed to share my slides, can I share that, Vinay? Yeah, please do. It. Go ahead. Yeah, I think you can see this. Yes. So uh, <clears throat> empowering the local solutions together, uh, this is very important because local solutions are still found as sporadic uh, fungal growth type of a thing. But the most important part is climate resilience lies within the local solutions. And uh, so this is not moving. The slides are not moving. Not moving. So uh -huh. Yeah. Would it help if we share it? Sure. I think can that be done? Uh, Doctor D, if you if you will allow me, there's a there's an arrow on the right side of this. Uh, the downwards arrow is the one I think you'll have to press. Uh, yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah, I could change that. Yes, thank you. So uh, coming back to the discussion, like the poly crisis that we are facing in, in, in the global south context, uh, the climate crisis already we have. We have the resource crisis because land is uh, getting emptied out, uh, forest is getting emptied out, and especially the marginal communities are tremendously at risk. So the livelihood crisis has added to that. So poverty alleviation, whatsoever we are doing, uh, difference in uh, the gender, the, the gender parity is increasing. And at the fundamental level, what we find is uh, the designated inequity uh, between the gender, between accessibilities everywhere that is coming up, linearity of the uh, economy, like uh, take, make, and throw. That is uh, very, I mean, uh, uh, importantly impacting the entire uh, local communities. Compulsion of uh, consumption, that is irresponsible consumption, continuing with the urbanites, and it's spreading out into the peri-urban to the rural. And on the other end, we have the pressure of the GDP, especially decarbonizing the economy. So all these things together is keeping three challenges 
uh, uh, keep, keeping us at, at our toes. And especially we'll have to design the resources. Uh, we have to go back to the circularity. Uh, livelihood security has to be entrepreneurship model. And women today, I mean, it's a very wonderful opportunity. Today is the World Women Day also. So I think livelihood should be focused on the women and definitely climate adaptive, climate resilient techniques uh, need to be uh, taken care of. It should come to the marginal commons. And uh, when we come to the field, what we find is certain drivers and certain barriers we have, uh, say, uh, found out. Communities' recognition to the urgency. They understand much better than us that what is more important to be done because they are more concerned about the kids, the families, the community itself. So that is a very important driver for any uh, intervention that we bring it to the uh, to the field level. And the close knit communities are basically knitting around the women. They are the mobilizers, and we need to find them at the grassroots. Like who actually is mobilizing the whole intervention to a more resilient pattern. Definitely, there are barriers, uh, less than optimum involvement of the local authorities. Uh, it's still now the line managers, the line departments, to bring them into one platform is a big barrier. Data gaps. Whenever we are trying to do something like modeling or uh, trying to develop some sort of an interpretation from the existing data, huge amount of data gaps is there. And uh, though it is being digitized, though things are being taken care in a way that, uh, okay, uh, whosoever wants uh, should have the access to metadata, but accessibility to data and data gaps together is uh, becoming a big barrier. Uh, the risk of maladaptation. Uh, in, in COP also, we raise this question, like a lot of uh, schemes are coming up, but we need to validate those schemes in a place-based uh, manner. Uh, say agroforestry, if it comes and takes away the rice ecosystem, I don't think it's a good adaptation, though we have a lot of uh, promising things in agroforestry. So the place-based type of a model is very important and inequitable accessibility. This has come up post pandemic, especially. The digital divide has created a huge barrier, uh, a, a huge type of a, a division between the rural and the urban. It has intensified the division. So we'll talk it about uh, some of the best practices that we could identify in the, I mean, in the post pandemic period is creation of rural entrepreneurship. Uh, we have a very successful model that we, uh, I mean, actually the idea is from Bangladesh itself, uh, that is float farming. And now it is spreading up uh, all over uh, South Asia. We are uh, working in Sri Lanka also, in Cambodia also. So uh, that is spreading up and that is doing very good because we try to keep two third uh, representation of the women in the decision making system. So that is what we found as a very important uh, practice. Setting up community based seed banks. We have developed seed banks, local seed banks, uh, which are resilient to, uh, to climate changes, climate change impacts. Like in Sundarban areas, uh, we have developed with Biodiversity Board uh, a seed bank of around uh, 60 uh, local uh, salt tolerant varieties of rice. So this is actually helping to develop the food security and not only rice, all the horticultural products, all the horticultural seeds, that seed sufficiency, seed resilience at the village level is very important and it has come up as a best practice and setting up the climate advisory services. With Asia Pacific Network, uh, we did a wonderful uh, project on climate information networking and that type of a uh, advisory system with a local language base. Like in Bangladesh, we are trying it with Bangla. In Bihar, we are trying it with Hindi. So that is helping us to reach out to the people and abolishing this uh, say digital divide. So even then, there are some uh, challenges what we found. One is the technology cooperation and capacity building. So whenever we are trying to put up something very resilient, there is still, there's a gap. And we need to build the capacities with the technologies that is coming up as a resilient technology. Innovative financing is needed, but not available. Even a lot of development agencies are trying to develop certain models, but it's not standardized. Uh, 
People do not understand basically what is innovative financing. Someone is saying blended finance is, uh, is important. Someone is trying to take advantage of this gap also. So this is a gray area to a certain extent, but definitely innovative financing is going to help us a lot because if we are trying to bring the resources to the hands of the common people, we have to have the financing models revamped, rethought, I would say, and bring it down to the doorsteps of the marginal commons. Uh, the last important thing is, again, I'm focusing on this, that is the digital divide. Everything is in the Android, but the Android is not in the hands of the commons. So this digital divide is creating a huge lot of barrier in this uh, climate milieu. And we need to give uh, a very uh, focused thought on this. And uh, some recommendations that we got from this, uh, I'll just make it short little, maybe uh, strengthening the drivers. We have the participatory land use and land cover management maps. We need to develop that. Provision of climate advisories at local languages, I already told that. Starting the gender inclusion conversa uh, uh, conversation right in the beginning of the approach. This is important. Then by addressing the barriers, we want to make like involving the policymakers at all level with AppLat also, we have developed certain, uh, we are getting good response. We have developed uh, this scientific tool for pricing of ecosystem services for the policymakers. And a lot of them are showing interest in that. Uh, developing place-based financing models. So it has to be very well thought, as I said, monitoring and evaluation system needs to be improved. And to manage the challenges, I think, uh, like developing the digital library, we are trying to do that. Like anyone sitting anywhere in the world can know what seeds I have, what type of technologies I'm doing uh, over in the uh, field and uh, how that can be accessed, like the metadata accessing uh, abilities has to be uh, spreaded over, like whosoever is working in the field should have this interface to understand uh, how it is happening. And improving the supply side value chain. So, uh, value chains uh, are important, but decarbonized supply chain, uh, supply side value chains, I think is very important. I'm trying to talk about uh, say solar run refrigeration systems. Uh, we need to bring the product that we are growing through entrepreneurship model in the rural areas to the main market. And this geographical barrier, this climate barrier uh, has to be uh, taken care of. Uh, and again, uh, this digital literacy at the women level, they need to understand how banking is done through an Android. So a lot of gaps are there, a lot of challenges are there, but even then, there are a lot of good news, I would say, and these small, uh, say, uh, interventions that are coming up at the field level needs to be now scaled up. And for that, we need a collaborative action. So together, definitely we'll be able to do that. Thank you very much. And over to you, Binaya. I'd be ready for the questions and other discussions. Uh, thanks. Thanks again to all of the esteemed panelists also. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Day. Yeah, it's always inspiring to hear you and uh, a lot of uh, examples from the field and uh, real, I mean, hope. I mean, you create during the presentation. It's really, really amazing. So I think let's uh, we will come back to the question answer and panel during yeah. the panel. So sure. then I, uh, next, uh, I would like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Sachi. Uh, She's a coordinator of uh, Himalayan University Consortium Secretariat at uh, ECMOD. So she will be today speaking about uh, one of our uh, model case site and locally led adaptation in Nepal, as well as her, and she will probably try to link it with uh, her vision for Himalayan University Consortium under how we can promote this uh, locally led adaptation as well as uh, um, uh, uh, locally that I've seen. So over to you, Dr. Uh, Sachi. Thank you so much, uh, Rinaya, and warm greetings to all panelists, uh, organizers, as well as uh, participants. It's wonderful to see some of the colleagues uh, of the APN uh, network, uh, as well as the project. Um, my presentation today, uh, I'm presenting it on behalf of uh, myself and my colleagues, uh, Manila Kharel, from Practical Action, uh, based in Kathmandu, Nepal. Now, before going in uh, some example uh, from the action research as part of the APN uh, project, I'd like to uh, share with you a tiny bit about my the, the consortium, uh, Himalayan University Consortium. I'm doing arrow. Okay. 
the Himalayan University Consortium, uh, of which I am coordinating. Uh, now, we are very much along the line, uh, similar to uh, the least developed country uh, consortium of universities for climate change, actually uh, hosted by uh, ICAS. Um, we, by now, uh, we already reached 107 uh, institutional members across these eight countries uh, on the map from Afghanistan to Myanmar and outside of the region as well. And what we do is to focus on mountain issues, uh, upstream, downstream linkages, not necessarily just the high altitude communities, but also midstream and downstream you know, communities uh, who also bear the impact of climate change. Um, and we do respect uh, diversity. And by that, we mean uh, differences in terms of uh, traditional school of thought, uh, perspectives, languages. I'm so glad that uh, Dr. Dipayan mentioned the local language in terms of outreach, and especially uh, with respect to my colleague Suman Basnet here, um, the community radio. So we do uh, engage uh, community level uh, radio broadcaster as well. And we look at uh, interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary approach in our uh, partnership. Uh, but without uh, going too much into details of uh, our consortium, uh, let me move on uh, to show you the list of the thematic working groups uh, that we are working uh, at the moment. Uh, and it's keep counting. Uh, on the screen, you see eight thematic working groups. And um, I'm very delighted to share with you that the youngest or newest uh, cross-cutting group or technical group is actually working on indigenous local knowledge, led by Dr. Binaya, uh, also Professor Maikuri from uh, HNB Grawal University in, uh, in India, uh, and then a colleague uh, from Pakistan, uh, Harika, uh, who works for the Ministry, uh, Federal Ministry of uh, Coordination, Climate Change Coordination. So you can already see the partnership between uh, scientific uh, scholars, uh, communities, and uh, government uh, offices as well. Now, um, let me go next uh, to present uh, the modern case studies uh, in Lumbini province. Uh, and the context of, of the province is, is one of, uh, of the seven provinces uh, in Nepal. And those community, Dang, Rukum, uh, and Ropa districts, uh, it's, a, it's a mix of a uh, combination of uh, populations uh, speaking different languages, having cultures, which is very distinct from one another in terms of uh, existing indigenous practices that had already been before uh, the impact of climate change, actually uh, back in a different type of disasters that uh, the community uh, already experienced uh, before the intensification of uh, climate change. Um, However, uh, the our migration of the population is, is, is having a very clear impact on desertification of agriculture, uh, but other aspects of uh, the community as well. Uh, and you can see it, you know, many houses actually remain closed. Uh, no one is home uh, and no one actually uh, cultivates uh, the land or take care of the forest. And this actually now uh, having an impact on the wildlife, uh, human wildlife uh, relationship or coexistence. We don't use the word conflict because that have a connotation that it is bad, adverse uh, kind of connotation. But if you use the word coexistence and you realize that if the land was left fallow, then uh, white boars or monkeys or any other wildlife coming in, uh, and if you know, if you farm uh, the land, land together next to one another uh, collectively, uh, individual farm holders, small holders, but at least the land is taken care of, then wildlife will have different behavior. But if it is, you know, the next plot, no one take care of, then uh, wildlife coming in and uh, dig all the roots up, and then you see the changes now. So it, things are all interconnected. If you talk about uh, out migration, what happens uh, in terms of, you know, wildlife moving in? Uh, in fact, so you just get one example of the complexity uh, of the reality on the ground, uh, and that issue cannot be solved either by science alone or by social sciences alone. It has to be put together. Uh, the solution has to be designed uh, with the community, first of all, uh, but then, you know, uh, biologists, uh, life sciences, uh, climate sciences, but also governance, um, 
social sciences has to work together. They do uh, together with the community in order to come up with a viable solution. Now, the key challenges here, uh, my colleagues Manila uh, listed out uh, as actually our colleagues, uh, esteemed panelists, uh, Dipayan, uh, Dipayan uh, already mentioned that different levels of challenges uh, and it felt at the local level. But if you're looking at the, uh, the losing uh, or the loss of communication about uh, intangible heritage in terms of the experience of knowing, of, um, well, now we use the term nature-based solutions. It has been there for centuries, but now we have a new term for it. Now, this is loss in terms of the previous generation or existing uh, generation would not pass on to their younger generation because youth is moving out. Uh, they don't return to the community. So these, these intergenerational gap in terms of sharing the intangible heritage of knowledge and traditional indigenous knowledge is quite alarming um, in that sense. Uh, apart from many other challenges that my colleagues Manila listed here. However, uh, we have to say um, well, we, we can be quite um, optimistic if we know that community actually take the matter into their hands. They have the solutions uh, quite spontaneous. Uh, in, in when we talk about spontaneous adaptation or coping mechanism, actually communities do not wait until specialists from outside come and tell you this is the solution. They are actually trying to solve the problem. Here you can see that they're trying to protect the crops uh, uh, using uh, pests, for example, or the lava uh, of the insects uh, to actually save the crops, the, the corn, for example. Uh, and that is actually uh, validated by the Agricultural Forestry University, AFQ, in, uh, in Bharatpur, in Nepal, that the lab uh, work is actually confirmed that this works, this works. And it's actually pat patented that now the company can move in. And we are talking about entrepreneurship here. We're talking about uh, scaling up and scaling out. So indigenous local knowledge already exists. Now, scientists coming in and validated it and proved that it works. Then you get the industrial patent and companies coming in and producing it. So now you see the model and it is accelerated. We are talking about acceleration of climate action. This is actually very within a very short time. Uh, I, I actually witnessed it. It's less than half a year. Uh, by the time the company can come and, you know, after the lab work, and actually the work is actually supported by USAID project, after the lab work that quite convinced uh, in terms of proof evidence, scientific evidence that this nature-based solution works, then the company can actually produce it at scale so that, you know, the next crop come, then you can use these to control the disease uh, of corn. So I give you one concrete example which is bottom-up participatory and transdisciplinary uh, between community, um, scientists, and industry. And it is positive and quite constructive that, you know, uh, and it's happening uh, without very much of a lot of nudges. So let me move on. And I think I'm about to finish uh, with the example. All these pictures are uh, many la want to show uh, case by case in terms of in terms of the preservation of crops, uh, neglected crops, for example, as a, as a form of security, food security and nutrition security, as well as other uh, forms of uh, spreading the risk, so to speak, in terms of uh, diversified uh, livelihood portfolio. You can see handicraft uh, production here uh, and other aspect of of the livelihood seen from holistic perspective. Now, what we learned uh, from the Himalayan University Consortium, so I'm, I'm uh, taking back my uh, view as, as a secretariat of the consortium, what we do, the partnership has to be start young so that we last. So we will wait until uh, PhD uh, scholars or you're going into the office. Actually, we start from high school, undergraduate students uh, to work with the community, in what we call vertical university, university. And by vertical university is a metaphor of the high altitude community when you start with somewhere 900 meters above the sea level, all the way up to 3000 
meters above sea level, and that is vertical. So we start with community uh, school, K to 12, high school engagement, you know, uh, actually uh, aware or uh, raising awareness of youth about the value of their own solutions, their own knowledge. So actually empower them that appreciating their culture, their language, and then come up with the solutions uh, together with them uh, through the university research, as I just take one example, laboratory work to uh, validate the local knowledge and then turn it into uh, the scale in terms of industry. Uh, so the partnership has to start pretty early on and should not wait until the issue is just so widespread. Uh, in a panic situation, the climate change hit, and then you become reactive. It has to be actually uh, slow onset. You have to prepare for the drought resistance. You don't wait until growth coming to you. So this resilience is already there uh, in terms of the mindset of the community. It has to be empowered by stronger communication. Now, the key takeaway uh, from uh, the partnership of, with the APN is it has to be um, uh, problem-based, solution-driven, uh, and it's it's the 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 decision making context has to be always place based and local. So our previous uh, esteemed panelist he emphasizes place based um, context that it has to be very much based on the local context and the self reliant mindset. I want to highlight here that we should not wait until donors coming in. Uh, we're talking about now uh, South-South-North collaboration. So you shift the equation to South already and triangular uh, partnership. But I'm actually pushing a bit more for self-reliant mindset. Let's not wait and we should not wait. And actually communities don't wait until outsiders coming in and help them. They are helping themselves. Uh, lastly, distributed leadership. Mm, and I, again, very much acknowledge and appreciate um, uh, our colleagues uh, from uh, radios, uh, community broadcasters, actually, they lead uh, the experience of broadcasting the importance of uh, millets as uh, neglected crops in their uh, provinces, in their own local languages, and they are actually the front runner in terms of climate action. Uh, with this, I'd like to end by these two quotes uh, on the screen uh, by the two female uh, activists, uh, climate activists. And they remind us that it seems like we share a lot of challenges, but the different boats we are in, uh, it means you know, whether we have the enabling conditions or whether we can change those conditions in terms of you know, enabling ourselves, but also by the way the community is still out there, having their own knowledge, it's already a resilience that we built. Over to you, uh, Binaya. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sachi. I think this, this is uh, very inspiring and you really guide us about what should be done. I mean, it's very clear, it, not just linking, you just didn't link like uh, what communities should do, but you also saw a path, how we can engage the various stakeholders, including private sector, into building resilience. And the most important thing that you, I hear is community don't wait outsider to come and solve their problems. So I think that's where I think we should be thinking more and how we can uh, add some uh, aid to their effort, right? So uh, then without any delay, so let me thank you so much once again. And I'd like to uh, invite uh, our um, another speaker, uh, um, Dr. Ho Nok Son. He's an associate professor and a deputy dean of forestry at TUAF. Uh, over to you, Professor Son. Thank you, Dr. Bainia. I am audible? Yes, yes, perfect. Yes. Uh, good afternoon from Vietnam to all of you, uh, panelists and audience. Uh, so my name is Sun Ho from uh, Hangwen University. So um, thank you, uh, APN and IJS for the opportunities to uh, present a case study in Vietnam about community resilience or uh, locally led adaptation in Vietnam. So um, I think the case uh, model case study in Vietnam. I think uh, Dr. Binaya already visit with us. Um, I think uh, last year. So it's in the north of Vietnam and uh, northwest of Vietnam. And in this uh, area, we um, got funding from APN IHS and other uh, grants to uh, support locally led adaptation to build 
local communities uh, adapted to climate change and we foster the ownership of the communities and uh, today i would like to um, uh, to present a few key findings from uh, the case uh, we have developed with communities even last uh, two years so we start with the uh, committee graph analysis to identify the graph and the need to adapt so we work with communities to identify the adaptation needs and also uh, develop the solution that is uh, feasible to local communities. So basically, we work with them to, to develop what is uh, um, work for them, what's good for them, and what is feasible. And in this area, as the Dr. Mayor had been seen, it's, uh, I think the lack of water or drought is one of the problem because it's a mountain area, it's a high terrain area. So the, the local communities, they face some change in the weather pattern and um, difficult to access to, to, to water for irrigation. So we work with them to develop some climate resilient practice as quick as work for them in the mountain area in, in Vietnam. I think it uh, could work for some uh, uh, other area in, 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 in the South Asia. So basically, we work with them and we identify some we call climate change resilient practice. And it's fall under the umbrella of nature-based solution to food security and climate change practice. For example, we work with them to develop a syntropic food forest. So what food forest means is it's, um, a forest that is uh, very diverse, like a uh, um, natural forest and it can provide food for local people. So it is very, I mean, um, good option for the local community to able to provide the food and also able to adapt to climate change because it's a diverse system. It's a multi-layer um, food forest. So it can cope very well, adapt very well to drought, to like a rain or unpredictable of uh, um, weather. We also work with them with uh, agroforestry using the local multi-purpose tree, uh, local herb, and local nuts so they can adapt to local climate and weather. And, and we also train the local people to apply circular agriculture practice. For example, with uh, vermi composting, so the local people can able to use the agriculture waste as an input, as a material for, for production of, of food. So by this way, we can minimize or it, mitigate the greenhouse gas. At the same time, we, we can uh, help them to adapt to climate change and uh, to be resilient. So here's a, an example of the food forest, what we mean by syntropic forest. So it's multi-layer of, uh, of the, the plants where the farmer can grow different kind of vegetable, different kind of fruit tree, and they also have tree. So it's very diverse uh, food system for, for the mountain area. Uh, by identifying the solution, we also work with them to provide the support, uh, the technical support, so they can able to, to implement, to do what they are planning. So we support them with planning and implementation. So that's uh, the process of um, uh, adaptive learning and collect, uh, collective actions uh, in, in, in this case study. In, that, in addition to uh, technical support, we also work with the farmers, women to provide the capacity building in leadership. It's very important in my perspective to able to, to promote the community resilience by or through community leadership. So we use in this, in this, uh, you can see that we, we change the, the people how to use the photo voice, how to use the photo voice to sell climate change by raising their voice. So in the end, they can build their capacity so they can um, better uh, involve or participate in the decision making process with the voice. Yeah, so you can see we start with um, analysis, the women, the committees are able to, to, to work with uh, 
with together able to identify the gap and to identify the need and plan for action. We also work with um, uh, them to apply the local uh, adaptation principles so they can uh, have better voice in the decision making process. And we want them to be an expert, or we call a local expert, so they can use their knowledge. We can help them to draw on their knowledge so they're able to to do to, to effective um, uh, lead the adaptation to climate change. So we can see the local lead adaptation can empower the women. The women now they can, I mean the after training, after the workshop, after the um, participants, they can they can um, stand up, they can uh, raise their voice, they can uh, actively participate in different uh, work of the committees. So they get um, uh, recognized by the local authorities in, in their contributions. Taking the um, lesson from the theory, we realize um, the four factors that is very important for climate change resilience. The first one is to support the, the people, the communities to, to learn with change, to learn with uncertainty, because climate change will bring a lot of uh, uncertainty. So it's very important for, 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 for communities, for, for outsiders to work together, to, able to build their, their, their capacity to learn with change. It's very important. The, the second one is, um, is, is a factor to, to nurture the diversity. For example, we can we, 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 we develop a portfolio of livelihood activities and the diversity of livelihood would, would have the communities to buffer to change. And that's, that's one of the, the important factors. The third one, which is important with the local led adaptation, is about the com combination of the local knowledge and the scientific knowledge. So we support the local community to, to draw on the use of knowledge so they can, they can increase their resilience to climate change. And the last one is to, to support the community to able to self-organize to, because, uh, because a lot of uncertainty, so they need to be able to self-organize to able to to adapt to change, we understand the change. So the capacity to sell online is very important. Yeah. So that's four factors that we think is very important for, for building resilience in the context of climate change. So the last, um, I mean, the, the, some key message from um, our work is we realize there are multiple of source of resilience that exists with communities in the locality. So now the, the role of policy, the role of outsider is to able to identify, to strengthen that uh, source. So the chunk of the committee to able to adapt to climate change. And we realize committee who are able to learn to live with change and uncertainty, they become more resilient. So that's the case we can, we can observe from our case study. Case study. And the committee can, can develop the source of uh, resilience through planning to collective action, to innovation and to learning. So that's, that's what we, um, we observe from um, working with companies in, in, our, in our model case size. Thank you very much. Back to you, um, Dr. Bainia. Uh, thank you, thank you, Professor Son. I think it's really interesting. I think uh, what I found it wonderful is that you put uh, different pieces together and you are moving in a direction that shows like uh, how we should move, yeah? And I think I, it's really excellent to see the progress you are making and creating real impact at the grassroots level. But I think let's discuss more during the panel. And then um, uh, without any further ado, then I, I would like to invite our next speaker, Mr. Suman Bosnet. He's a regional director for AMARC Asia Pacific, the Association of World uh, Radio Broadcaster, Community Radio Broadcaster. So he will be talking about the role of communities uh, community radio in in particular uh, promoting this uh, indigenous and local knowledge system. So over to you, uh, Sumanji. Biniji, thank you very much. Uh, greetings, everyone. Good morning to everyone. I'm very privileged to be in the same city as Dr. Shivagoti and Dr. Stachi. That's Kathmandu. 
and I'm also the dark horse in this panel, because, uh, given that I'm not an expert on climate change adaptation uh, by any yardstick. Uh, nevertheless, I'm very happy to be in this very distinguished panel. Uh, in my, uh, basically what I would like to do is, uh, in my presentation today, a very brief one uh, rather, I would like to share with you some information about an initiative that was undertaken in relation to the broad theme of this panel. So with your permission, I'd like to share my slides. I have a few slides only. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, perfect. Okay. So uh, between the years 2021 and 2022, uh, my organization, that is the World Association of Community Radio Broadcasters, we call it AMARC in short, implemented a project to engage community radios for promoting indigenous and local knowledge for climate change adaptation. This project, which was part of a larger project called Development of Adaptation Communication Framework for Mainstreaming Indigenous and Local Knowledge in the Hindu Kush Himalayan region, was implemented in partnership with the Institute of uh, for Global Environmental Strategies, IGES, and the APN. So moving to the next slide, uh, I'm, I'm going to put up those slides so that you can read some of those points yourself and also look at the pictures. But at the same time, I'll just go on describing what we did with the project. So we basically worked with about 10 community radios in total from four countries. And those countries were Bhutan, Bangladesh, India, and Nepal, basically for two objectives. One was to enhance their understanding of climate change. And second was to help them understand the significance of indigenous and local knowledge for climate change adaptation and learn creative ways of promoting such knowledge in local communities through interesting and attractive radio programs. Our activities were uh, fairly simple and straightforward. We just wanted to enable community radios to record, produce, and disseminate programs on indigenous local knowledge for climate change adaptation. We wanted to leverage the proximity of community radios with local communities, especially in rural locations, to introduce community radios as a centerpiece of an adaptation communication frame, framework in relation to climate change adaptation. The fact that community radios are owned and operated by community members in local languages and focusing on local issues made it that much more attractive to partner with them on an, on an issue that is so close to grassroots communities. It's given that community radios are the most effective forms of mass media in the local and rural context. We only needed to infuse the information that, that was needed to create a matching level of excitement regarding the value of indigenous and local knowledge for dealing with challenging climatic conditions and to discuss a few creative ways for transformation, transforming such knowledge into attractive and effective programs. This objective was achieved through a tripartite collaboration among community radio journalists, climate experts, and communication experts. As you can see in the slide, this is a picture from a radio that is located in uh, in Midwestern Nepal. Uh, it's called Radio Guru Baba. It's very close to this uh, town, city town called uh, Nepal Ganj. It's in, it, this is located close to, as I said, in Western Nepal. And in this picture, you can see the broadcaster talking to a, uh, a local community member. This radio station, uh, they have a program called Ajubat, which is a program to record and transfer indigenous and ancestral knowledge from village elders about traditional ways of dealing with adverse climatic conditions such as drought, famine, and etc. There's one more slide just to give you an example of how community radios work. This is an example from India, actually, from Jharkhand. This is a, that this is an image of uh, two broadcasters from Asur FM. It's a very, although they are called FM, they don't actually broadcast on FM, they do narrow casting, which is basically uh, going to the local market and uh, to the hard bazaar. It's a weekly market that, uh, and broadcasting in a, uh, in, in what you might call through speakers. It's a kind of a live broadcasting in a very um, uh, grassroots sense. And they broadcast in Asur tribal language in Jharkhand state. Asur language is listed by UNESCO as a definitely endangered language. 
And the, this FM is at the center of an initiative underway for preserving the indigenous language and knowledge that it holds with it. So these were some examples of how community radios are working. Oh, sorry, I wanted to stop sharing the slides. Do you still see the slides? No. Okay. So, so although this project was carried out on a pilot basis and only for about a year, the results were highly encouraging. It was heartening to note that several of the partner radios have actually embedded the idea of promoting indigenous and local knowledge into their mainstream program, and they continue to work with local communities on the topics. So we are basically talking about a huge potential that is waiting to be tapped into. There are about seven to 800 community radios in South Asia alone. Majority of these radios are operating in rural areas. They fulfill the information and communication needs of the most marginalized and vulnerable, and the ones that are often neglected by large public broadcasters and popular commercial broadcasters. However, to realize this potential fully, some basic orientation is required. Marginal additional investment of resources can result in exponential rise in conditions that are conducive for inclusive climate action. So in conclusion, I strongly recommend to the scientific community, to the policymakers and the civil society actors to recognize the community media sector as the best available vehicle for bridging the gap between scientific knowledge and traditional knowledge. There are civil society run radios and radios operated by academic institutions. There are also internet-based broadcasters and podcasters that are equally popular. Let's get them involved in inclusive climate action to reduce the effects of climate change on the most vulnerable and to ensure that the benefits and burdens of climate actions are equitably distributed. With that, I'll rest my argument. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sumanji. Really appreciate and for bringing so highlighting the real hidden potential of community radio that is almost uh, most probably unknown from the climate communities. And I think uh, we hope that we can continue to engage with community radios in coming days. And uh, with that, I think now we are in the process of going through the panel discussion. So before that, I would like to uh, first thank our colleague uh, uh, Mia Barbara Arens from APN. Uh, she is doing wonderful job. Uh, sharing this uh, Jamboard. I think you uh, please have a look. She's, uh, she's uh, coordinating this uh, Jamboard. So I think we can also, uh, while we are discussing in panel, we can also have a look on what our other attendees have provided. And they are also equally important. I mean, uh, feedbacks and uh, viewpoints, and this really helps us. So without any further ado, I would like to invite all the speaker in this uh, panel discussion. So uh, in that respect, uh, maybe uh, I would uh, start with uh, uh, Dr. Day. Uh, basically, I think uh, what you have uh, shown us is like a, a, a real example, challenges, need. And basically what we are um, uh, struggling, if, despite there are many lessons and challenges, but, and, but the uh, severity of climate impact at the same time is also increasing. So given that 2023 was a very worst in some of climate change in breaking several of the records. And that uh, brings us like a, how we could, um, if I borrow uh, uh, such a scale up and scale out this local solution so that uh, we can uh, uh, realize the transformative potential of this locally led adaptation. In that respect, uh, what would be your take? Like what we basically need to do in order to trigger, I think uh, transformation is a long process, in order to trigger, what could be the uh, steps we could uh, take? So maybe you could uh, 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 provide your insight and so that we can further advance this discussion today. Sure, <clears throat> thank you for this question, uh, Vinay. Uh, this is really uh, a, a point that we often brainstorm, even in the field with the community, with the policymakers. There are a few bottlenecks that need to change faster than the way climate is changing. Our policies don't change so fast as the climate changes. A simple example I would like to give you that we had developed a very sustainable float farming uh, method 
But when we wanted to go for credit linkage with the banks, they said that, see, in our drop-down menu, float farming doesn't arise. If you want to cultivate potato, we have a loan. Cultivate mage, we have a loan. Rice, we have a loan. But float farming, we don't know what exactly it is. So this is a very, I mean, trivial, I'd call it a very funny type of a bottleneck that, that uh, hits us. So I need to uh, convey this message that as we develop these things, uh, rightly said by my panelists, as we develop these things, this has to go directly to the, uh, 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 I mean, policy processing uh, arena. Unless this is taken up by the policy uh, people, uh, it's not coming up to, I mean, scale out is definitely important, but scaling up and scaling out needs policy backups. So this is a very important point that we have to advocate, uh, lobby, whatsoever we have to do. The second important thing is uh, the communities are still taken as liabilities by the funding agencies, by the uh, this, uh, this financial institutions. Communities are not liabilities. I mean, whenever you look at their, say, uh, their, uh, uh, say, loan credibility or, say, credit uh, credibilities, they don't have anything. Maybe they are landless farmers or something. But we have to understand that the human resource, their knowledge, their, uh, say, perseverance, their adaptive capacities, these needs to be social, I mean, brought under social audit. And that has to be translated into uh, monetary uh, forms, fiscal forms, like as we did with APN very recently, uh, the ecosystem services that they protect, that ecosystem service has got a value, a price. Now, can we keep that as a part uh, of their credibility, the, the service that they are protecting? So if that comes up, that can also be taken as uh, something like a collateral to finance them. So here we need to have very innovative type of a out of the box thinking and consider them as assets, not liabilities. The last point that I would like to say is uh, just transition in education is still not happening. We do capacity building, but capacity building is not a very wholesome um, mode of education. We just for a particular technology, we uh, train them or because you see, this is a soft skill development thing and uh, getting funding is really difficult. But it is a very important, a hardcore component of uh, resilience building. So it should be continual. It should be, uh, I mean, uh, uh, brought down to the base of the community and it should be a thorough method. So this part, I think uh, we need to understand it in, in uh, wholesome education. That includes digital education also. And women, this just transition has to be taken very seriously. Women should come up. When I say gender parity, definitely I'm not only talking about women, but just to bridge up, just to make it into a, into a balanced level. I think these are the main things that uh, we need to focus. And uh, yeah, uh, of course, my esteemed panelists will add on uh, to this. So at the moment, yes, this much I would like to... Uh, uh, thank you very much. I think uh, you raised uh, three important points, like a policy and uh, recognize the community potential, not as liability, and the education, how we impart education and capacity building. And uh, of course, there is a need for investment. Uh, a lot of things has to be go into that uh, to uh, facilitate such kind of uh, processes. So uh, then I'd like to uh, probably invite uh, Professor Son. Uh, uh, basically, I think just to connect here, I mean, uh, you have also sewn, you are fitting a different piece and looks like it's a very successful model already to me. But I mean, uh, when it comes to like uh, going beyond the area that you are working in the, especially considering the context of Vietnam and there are uh, several kind of adaptation projects also flowing into your country. Uh, what do you see as a way forward? I mean, in order to bring this of course, like he said, to the policy attention, the importance of this to the policy attention, and then also how we recognize the community and uh, I mean that you have already demonstrated how community could be engaged, how to incentivize them. These are already clear, but then how we, uh, what do you see as a things to do if we want to broaden the scope of your work 
in multiple areas. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Benya. Um, so I understand that we, if we're going to uh, upscale our, I mean, so-called success um, practice to a wider area in Vietnam or elsewhere. So what we have or often to do in Vietnam, we got it's, I understand the context here. So it's important to, to advocate from the bottom to policy level. That, that's the way to ensure our action uh, mainstream or in line with the government policy direction or, I mean, programs. Because what we are doing here is very small grant or project. So if mm -hmm. we want to do it, I mean, at the level, the government have plenty of money out there in different as program and project. So we need to work with them to win, we need to work with them to, to ensure what we are doing here is in line with what they are doing. And what we are doing here is contribute to what they are doing. So we don't want to try to isolate what we are doing as a climate change project, what they are doing as a social economic empowerment or improvement for the local communities. So we try to bring different stakeholders like government, agency, NGO, or us like a university together to make sure we are we have the same the common understanding and then we can able to integrate what we are doing as small scale or pilot uh, project into the wider area to government programs because the government they have plenty of money but they work in different way so we make sure we work with them in line with what they are doing so i think it's about collective action, planning, learning together, and cooperation is, a, is a, so what we are, need to do, yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Song. Uh, this is really, I think it partly answers what uh, Professor Day was saying. And of course, I think the point is like uh, how we basically communicate, right? How we bring, have a common understanding so that we don't have a mismatch targets like a government going one way, a researcher going another way, media saying, okay, we don't know what to do. We are never given a chance to uh, engage in this kind of uh, endeavor. So in that respect, I would like to go back to Sumanji because you are from the media and we also see you have a huge potential for com connecting and communicating the needs and priority in a way that can be understood by a uh, broader, like even a layman. So in that uh, uh, respect, what do you see as a uh, role of community media. I, I, I think you can even go a little beyond community media and how we can use it as a vehicle for achieving this rapid uh, transformation, how we can mobilize this potential to bridge the information gap. Uh, basically, rather than information, understanding how we can bring help to have a common, uh, develop common understanding. Thank you, Biniji, for the question. The, you know, on one hand, we are, we are, we are, we are very keen on um, developing a mode of communication and information that is entirely owned and participated by the local communities. Uh, and the, the benefits of uh, that kind of media are obvious. I don't need to explain. They're very close to the people. As I said in my slide, they speak the local language. They understand the local challenges and concerns. They live the same life as community members live. So they really have their hands on the pulses of the communities. Uh, the, but the trade-off is that uh, there will be a gap in, in, uh, in the communication of scientific knowledge uh, to these broadcasters, local journalists, if you like, and they're off to the communities. So, um, as I said in my presentation as well, we are basically talking at this moment about a huge potential, uh, given that uh, community broadcasting is becoming, community media for that matter, is becoming very prevalent, is very prevalent. We have moved through various stages of community media. Uh, just to give you an example, in Nepal alone, uh, we started with wall newspapers way back in early in the 1990s, we used to have something called wall newspapers, which were published by uh, the neo-literates, if you like. Uh, you know, uh, senior citizens who had taken literacy classes 
and they would publish uh, uh, newsletters. Then we moved into loudspeaker broadcasting. We used to call it narrow casting. In India, that's how broad community radio started. Uh, cable television suppliers were given the incentive to hand over one channel to broadcast audio only, which would go into houses, taking some community-based information. And we have now arrived at a point where broadcasting is on FM, on internet, and we are reaching out to different uh, starters of demography in the community. But then again, we are talking about potential, that the, the penetration is really deep, but how do you use that potential for climate change adaptation or for or promoting resilient communities? I think the answer is in bringing the scientific knowledge closer to these broadcasting broadcasters so that you enhance their capacity, and then they in turn will take the knowledge in a way that is usable to the local communities. That's one thing. The other is in, in this particular project that we work with, IGS and APN, we were basically looking at the role of community radios in digging out what the knowledge that already exists in the community in the form of traditional local indigenous knowledge for climate change adaptation and, and documenting such knowledge. And at the same time, also transforming the information collected from senior citizens, especially in the communities, into interesting radio programs so that the newer generation gets involved in it. You, you have personally witnessed an example in Sindhu Palchuk where a community radio over there, Radio Sindhu, actually organizes interactions in, in the local school, interactions between students and uh, elderly uh, community members in that community. And they discuss a lot of things about, they discuss in very plain colloquial language. Well, what did you do when there was a drought? Or how did you make sure there was a lot of, you maintain, how did you maintain the water bodies? Or, you know, how did you uh, work with certain agriculture tools? Or uh, despite the lack of uh, agriculture tool and all of that. And and the knowledge in within the classroom gets transferred from uh, the senior citizens to the students, but the radio picks up. They, it basically records the audio and uses it to make programs uh, on the uh, for the radio station to broadcast to a much wider audience. And that's where the role of community media really comes in. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sumanji. I think uh, I think uh, you highlight like uh, uh, there is still a huge need. I mean, how. Basically, before we engage community radio, we also need to empower them, right? So, and that's uh, that's bring us to like the very close to that. How we actually create, you know, uh, interaction, create a, a platform where scientists, uh, communities, media, and practitioner they can come together, right? I think that's uh, what is we are seeing, and and that is it's a complex thing and directly linked to the resource and purpose. So with that, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Sachi. So since you have been uh, uh, engaged with especially a network of universities and you are also aware of different areas, it's not just like you are working on the tra traditional knowledge of local data adaptation, you are also dealing with education, um, disaster and so many thematic areas. So in that respect, what do you think as like, a, uh, how we could promote the cross-learning? I think the key point here is a cross-learning among different stakeholders. And um, especially if we say this, uh, this being the uh, Gobeshina you know, being locally led adaptation, for, example, for instance. So in, within your SKS region, so how we could promote this cross-learning? I mean, do in the sense that how you see the, future uh, vision, your future vision for the education. Uh, I mean, that came, I think all of the panelists has uh, pointed out that point. So could you just uh, say to us, uh, give us some guidance, how we could uh, enhance this uh, cross learning, given your experience in this uh, dealing with a huge network? Over to you, Sachi. Thanks so much, Vinaya. And I'd like to echo uh, my uh, panelists in highlight the importance of uh, coordination. Uh, in because the issue is not only complex but actually wicked in a way that you know you really for a wicked problem you need a total like the whole society approach but then by the time we say whole society approach we kind of lost the nuances in between so my first take is I, I, I just share with you that uh, in fact in within the community of university uh, this particular uh, consortium that uh, I'm serving, uh, the Himalayan University Consortium, they actually, there is a movement to even cross out the word university. Uh, Vice Chancellors come and said, uh, esteemed colleagues, 
can we just take out the word university and take the knowledge business out of university worlds? That means it has to start from community outside of those academic institutions, because actually the true knowledge or wisdom lies in the community. So you see one between science with capital S, and on the other side, you have wisdom with capital W. And local radio uh, broadcasters, uh, communities like uh, Dr. Sun mentioned, they are actually the owner, the heritage bearer of the wisdom with capital W. So between science versus wisdom, can we strike a balance? This is the first question. I may not have the answer, but just, just, just to share with you the foundational kind of uh, shaking up because we need to unlearn, de-learn the paradigm of doing development for the people. Actually, it has to do by the people themselves. So back to your question, Vinaya, in terms of uh, how are we going to see the partnership uh, in the long run? And you start with the very important point that transformation takes time. It, it will not, within the project cycle, then Dr. Sun mentioned that, you know, the government has project, uh, academic has project, usually project lasts for about three years, five years, sometimes 10 years but we need to look beyond the project cycle. It has to be in terms of generational uh, building the transformation. So I have a submission uh, to the panel and to uh, participants that let's think of transformative um, learning uh, and just, but the word just in transition part is actually has to come from all sectors of society and led by all sectors of the society. Uh, and that's the only way to make transformation happens in a very stable manner, instead of you know, coming from outside uh, again. Last but not least, uh, I very much echo uh, my uh, co-panelist in highlighting that, in fact, if you looking at the drive of change, again, you know, the society, the, the forces are up there, the coordination and the communication has to be improved a lot within sectors, so cross-sectorial, uh, multi-dimensional. And the, again, I have a feeling that the fragmentation is still very much somewhere that, you know, pulling the puzzle together. We need to find a way to put the puzzle together innovatively by platform, for example, when you talk about e-learning. Can we talk about e-capacity, capacity building in the virtual or hybrid uh, platform that nowadays actually people can afford to pay perhaps uh, from five uh, equivalent of five to 10 US dollars to learn for themselves. Entrepreneurs want to learn what does it mean by green financing and what does it mean by nature-based solution. They want to learn so that they can apply to their own business and they are willing to pay with the facility that uh, e, uh, ePay, uh, phone pay facility, it's possible by the learner themselves. It used to be supply uh, driven, but now the capacity uh, aspect is actually become demand driven now. We need to shift the thinking in terms of capacity building because I have a feeling that in order to go post uh, 2030, we're talking about SDGs 2030, in order to be future fit, uh, post 2030 uh, outlook, we really have to find a way to make the best use of e-learning, uh, as you said, uh, uh, Professor Day, that you know, just transition in, in education or in capacity building is not really happening unless and until we actually synergize with the potential out there uh, in terms of, uh, of the learning uh, platforms that are offered by technologies. Uh, back to you, Vinaya. Uh, thank you, Sachi. You really made excellent point and give us like a vision on how the capacity building should so go, so, uh, goes, should go forward. Uh, Applauses, my uh, words are not coming. Uh, I think before I go to the next round of question, I would like to maybe encourage our attendees here. Uh, please feel free to uh, share your question if you have any questions to panel on the uh, slide number three of this jamboard. Let's provide your name as well, and so that if there are any, if we have time, uh, we will happy to entertain your question uh, to our panel. So, uh, next round of uh, discussion, I'd like to go uh, 
basically common question to all of you. I mean, what we have uh, seen is we have done a lot of grassroots level activity. We have seen encouraging results. These all are happening, but my personal experience when I go to the site or discussion, there is a basically lack of uh, retention of capacity. Some projects has done something in the past and new project has come repeatedly. They do similar thing and and looks like there are there are few uh, energetic uh, local leaders who are driving. I, I should not say there's nothing is happening. But in that sense, I mean, one of the missing aspect when we move to transformation or where we want to see effective adaptation is uh, monitoring. And this being also the, the theme of this uh, Govishina conference. Uh, where do you see the need and potential of monitoring, the role of monitoring and to re, uh, in order to retain, build up and institutionalize and retain the build capacity? So if you have any insights on that, how we could move forward in this? I mean, this is a kind of a question I have been often encountering, but not a really very good solution. I mean, we have at this moment. So if you could uh, say the light, so maybe I, I will, uh, maybe now I uh, would like to go to Professor Son first. I think for, um, for all project and climate change project in, 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 in spe um, specifically, I think monitoring is very important to make sure that we are on track, so we are able to achieve what we plan to, to do. And what we learn from, I mean, the model based side in Vietnam, where you have been, is we have to work with uh, local authorities. So we try to we try to integrate with what we are doing in 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 in, in the side with what the the government are doing. So by that way, by that way, we are able to 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 mobilize resource from from the local authority to be able to monitor to be able to make sure that we are uh, on the right track, or we at least we get some feedback and the, the comment from the local authorities. So they are able to, 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 to adjust what we are doing. Yeah, that's the, the, the one point. There's, there's the point that we are applying at the case is, we, need, we work with um, private sector, with business. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you see in the case side that we work with private sector, and the private sector, like enterprise, like the company, they, I mean, they cooperate with um, the farmers to, to, um, to, I mean, to, um, to commercialize, uh, commercialize uh, the agriculture products, for example. And then, to that way, they also able to monitor with what we are doing is, uh, I mean, I mean, on the, I mean, common understand or not. So. Mm -hmm. We try to involve or try to work. We have to cooperate with different actors and and, and stakeholders like local, local authorities, like private sector. So by that way, we can able to cross learning, mm -hmm. cross with what we're doing. So I think that's that's a key. I mean, learning we I mean we see very helpful for for our future project um, uh, mm -hmm. elsewhere. Uh, thank you, Professor Son. If I uh, quickly summarize and what I take from your message is we have to make monitoring as a part of the real implementation, right? There should be value of the monitoring. It should not be just we want to monitor, but there should be the monitoring should have also some benefit, right? Yes. So, and then um, maybe I would like to move to Dr. Dave, if you would like to add something, um, echo something, or uh, if you have a different uh, experience, whatever. Yeah, I think uh, in my uh, presentation also, I, if, I mean, I wanted to emphasize on this point that monitoring and evaluation is very important. And I just echo what uh, Dr. San has really said. Uh, it's, it's really true that <clears throat> unless we put values to that, uh, my personal experience says that uh, some sort of a mindset change is also needed. Like when we do monitoring and evaluation, uh, it's like always some third party will come and mm -hmm. assess. But it's always better to have monitoring done by the person himself and his comets. Intra monitoring is a very effective thing, and that builds up a sort of a uh, competition between them. 
and you monitor the monitoring process, not uh, mm -hmm. the, the process itself. So that is one, one technique that uh, gives us a very good result. Another thing is, uh, again, another mindset, when we monitor a project, we just talk about the project activities, mm -hmm. like how many uh, crops you have grown, wh what has been the damage and loss. So instead of that, if we monitor a little bit wider, like what problem he had at his home, or what problem the lady had in the community itself that she couldn't monitor these things. So all these are integrated chain-like systems. So a little bit wider things, if we try to visualize, we can get a realistic picture. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> see, any intervention, uh, the sustainability directly links with the cash flow. Mm -hmm. So if that cash flow is gone somewhere, everything comes to a halt. It's a very common mm. aspect everywhere in the global south. So real-time contingency planning has to be given. You just go and monitor and come back and don't say anything. That is uh, not uh, really, I mean, appreciated by the uh, partners. So what you'll have to do is you'll have to give them real-time contingency plans. Like, okay, fine, you have failed, no problem. Or this problem is coming, fine. This challenge so you give some solutions to them how to cope up with the changes. Mm -hmm. So then naturally they will develop, it will be very adaptive and participatory. And these things, if we add on with the monitoring system, I think we'll definitely get good results. Yes, yeah. thank you so much. I think this is a really, really important point. I mean, we need to change the mindset. And when we say monitoring and evaluation, it's just for the formality, right? For the official purpose, whether you have done or not accountability, but this is not the, this is the scope is not just accountability. We have to make uh, MNE as a part of the uh, making progress. I mean, in Japan, I, I think we have this PDCA cycle plan to act and kind of thing, which has, I think the similar idea. That means the uh, quality improvement has to be continuous process. So I think that's, I think we are basically missing. I, I believe there is nothing such kind of established process. I think we have, we are very far from doing that uh, aspect. And uh, I would like to go to Sumanji because you are leading this uh, AMARC organization. You also engage in a lot of capacity building. And there is, I think uh, in that respect, how has been your experience in uh, building the capacity and then monitoring how the community radios are progressing, how they are benefiting. Is there anything that climate change community or adaptation community could learn from your experience? Thank you, Viniji. Uh, from, from our experience, from the project that we implemented in 2021-2022 uh, for a span of about a year, uh, I could clearly see that radios were very interested, uh, very excited. Uh, for two reasons. One is that they suddenly realized that we are basically talking about nothing new. It was something that they were um, experiencing in everyday life and that they, all around them and something very close to the to the lives of the communities that they seek to serve. But at the same time, when you give them ideas about how to uh, go about it, that is something that they find extremely beneficial and something that they consider to be new. Uh, kind of a value add to the service that they are trying to provide to the community. And I also, as I said in my presentation, uh, despite the the period that has uh, the gap between the time when we actually implemented the project and that too with a very small number of radios uh, and, and and until now, we still see some of those radios continuing doing the work mm. in the in line with what we had discussed in, during the the project workshops that is a, a systematic method of documenting and promoting indigenous uh, local knowledge for climate change adaptation so you know community radios speak in a very colloquial language some of those terms that we use in workshops or in scientific meetings are actually not so much in use uh, so uh, when when you tell them that that there is a close connection between the colloquial exp expressions that are used in the in, in, in the community and and the scientific terms or the formal terms that are discussed in a in a meeting like this actually mean the same. It's it's very exciting for them and they immediately see the connection over there. So I, I think in that regard, yes, uh, it's definitely worthwhile investing 
uh, on community media. They, uh, I think community media bring in a lot of value to all of all the issues that have been uh, said so far by the very learned panelists in this in this pr program so far, uh, whether it's about uh, uh, filling in the digital gap. Um, I mean, we've always had this gap. We've had analog gap, and now we have digital gap. And uh, though we have moved into digital gap, the analog gap still is there in our communities. So community radios do have a possibility of filling in that gap or scaling up or, or expanding the learning uh, and sharing uh, mechanism within the communities. Community radios, by involving community radios, you're basically, uh, you'll be adding value to the work that you're already doing, including self-monitoring and evaluation, I think. We do have examples of that, not exactly in climate change adaptation sector as per se, but in many other social development areas. So there are good examples, good practices regarding that as well. Thank you, Sumanji, uh, uh, for uh, providing us like a, how you see as a community media. I mean, you, and a good thing that you say that there are a lot of examples. I think we can explore further when we discuss. And I think all of mem all of the audience here, I think attending this, even panelists, uh, uh, I think can contact you. Uh, if they would like to learn a specific way how you are working. So with that, uh, I'd like to now move to Sachi. I mean, the one point, I think this comes a digital divide. I mean, that also came during the presentation. And one thing, I mean, if we, uh, uh, one aspect of this uh, digital technology or the communication technology is that it can uh, make this monitoring process very efficient. So if like, if I go to Sumanzi, whatever thing you do is basically recorded, right? So even if you don't do monitoring, you already have a record because this is recorded and kept somewhere. So it can be already revisited. I mean, you can track, you can really track what you did in the past and where you are, right? And so in that respect, uh, what do you think, how we should uh, probably uh, try to exploit the potential of this, uh, uh, uh digital technology and 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 also and in the same way with that way we can minimize this uh, digital gap if you have any insight from your experience from HUC or in this mcs project yeah that's thank you so much Vinaya. Uh, before responding to your question i just want to share a very concrete example uh when sumanji mentioned that uh the colloquial language uh and the scientific language so now this particular winter, uh, the Hindu Kush uh, experienced no drought, meaning the lack of snow. Now, for scientists, uh, cryosphere uh, scientists and hydrologists and climate scientists, of course, the term is no drought. But the people on the ground, uh, communities from those uh, glacier uh, or those uh, foothill at the foothill of the glaciers, all they observed is the blackened, the mountain. The mountain used to be snow cap and the mountain suddenly turned black. So at one of the conference uh, in Pukhara last December, one community member stood up and asked a scientist, say, can you please explain why our mountain turned black this year? So this is just one example, how community actually noticed that. They know that they need snow, snow fat because of the water they need water for their orchard, uh, because you know in Pakistan, for example, you need uh, the water come down, especially melting this season, so that they water the orchard, you know, uh, or the stone fruit trees. And they just ask very simple and coming straight from their heart. Uh, but then it so it touched the scientists and social scientists that the scientific phenomenon of snow drought is in a very simple term that why our beautiful snow-capped mountain turned black this year. And that associated with a lot of spiritual aspect uh, and also belief as well, you know, whether we are punished because we are doing something bad uh, and this is a bad omen. So I'm not going to elaborate in that example, just to share as a way to echo that understanding between the communities and scienti uh, scientific uh, communities need to be uh, not closer to one another. But to the question, uh, Vinaya, in terms of digital divide, before that, I actually want to step back a bit and say monitoring for whom and by whom. Mm. Uh, Professor Cern, actually, you mentioned that all, all project, you know, from the government, from donor, you need 
uh, to monitor the success of the progress from accountability perspective. You have to be accountable to donors. You have to be accountable to the government, to the taxpayer. But then uh, when Dr. Day, you also mentioned that monitoring is adaptive and participatory because people need to know by themselves whether they put the effort in vain. Now, stakeholder fatigue is an issue. You just keep coming and asking them to do focus group discussion, stakeholder engagement again and again, the same group coming, you organize beginning of the year and next year, another group coming in and doing the same stakeholder engagement. They are actually very tired of stakeholder engagement. It's called fatigue because there is lack of accountability in terms of sharing the data, you know, different groups of development or let's say climate change um, organizations uh, uh, coming in and actually exhaust community with all of these tick box. So what I'd like to propose to the panel and uh, audience is that we have to maybe rethink the entire process because when the community really wants to monitor in terms of whether they put the effort in, whether it's worthwhile, whether it pays off, then it's their own stake and responsibility to monitor. And then we go to how uh, in terms of the open access and, and now I come to it and I type in the chat here, it is a principle, it's called care principle uh, for indigenous data uh, governance. Now, uh, without going into very much detail, you can click the link and you can see what it is. The point here is the local community can actually generate the data by themselves using the tools that are available out there in terms of like I already type in the one of the chat bo uh, board, one of the um, jam board that uh, tools like OpenStreetMap, for example, which is entirely open. Anyone, not anyone own a gadget, first of all. And Internet connectivity is not universal. We have to acknowledge that. However, wherever internet is possible and whoever has a gadget, at least understand the concept of coordinates in terms of the coordinates, and then you can upload. For example, you can upload the map of the community exit route, the granary storage in terms of the grain, where you store the grain, so that you know that you're not going to go hungry uh, because now the flood will hit. Mm. This is where I store, the community store the grain. So all of these community-based mapping is actually a part of data generation or co-generating of data by themselves. And Kobo Toolbox, I also uh, type in the note in the Jamboard, mm. works offline as well. So Kobo Toolbox is a tool uh, developed by Harvard Group and it is free uh, for development and humanitarian community. I'd strongly encourage uh, every project to look it up uh, and use this combination of tools. And there are lots of other tools like OpenStreetMap and Kobo Toolbox. It's powerful tools in terms of you know, geospatial uh, and it is open and free accessibility. So again, there are tools out there, but the philosophy or the mindset has to change because people need to know themselves whether their effort is not in vain in terms of just follow a project, yet another project coming from the district, another project coming from the federal government, from the province government, and they're just running after these projects. So it's actually the opposite. We have to shift that, hey, we want to know whether we are more uh, resilient, we are stronger, whether the money that we borrow can be uh, returned. Uh, so uh, Professor Day, actually, when you mentioned about value nature, uh, I actually want to advocate for value culture as well. So if we can value culture in terms of intangible asset, uh, as you mentioned, that it has to be considered as credibility, it, can, it should be put as collateral, as a collective strength, that kind of thing can be documented in the database that uploaded by community themselves through, uh, again, open tools. And it's entirely free uh, because it's right open right there, open coding. You can actually know who edited, who uploaded from where. But of course, you know, issues of AI and privacy and a lot of ethical concern is on the site that we need to actually sort it out in terms of accountability as well. Or the interviews uh, that we are doing, uh, focus group interview or in-depth key informant interview, it can be called 
gone, it has some potential uh, matter of conflict and Sumanji, you are aware of this very well. If in the situation of conflict in the community, of course, you know, political party, but also other forces, civil society could have the comments that is going to come across one another. We have to make sure that the informants are, uh, are protected. Uh, so all of these uh, ethical concern has to be being aware of. So everything has at least two sides of things. So without you know, elaborate too much into it, I'd like to propose that it's time for us to rethink the entire paradigm of monitoring impact assessment that put it in the hands of the people. And there are tools out there for them to try it out. Back to you, Binay. Yeah, thank you, Satsi. I think you, what we what you you, refer, you what you pointed out this really led us to rethink. I mean, are we doing the right thing or not? I mean, even I mean the way we design project, we way we collaborate, way we approach community. I mean, there is a lot of things going on, and I totally agree with you. Like when we go to the stakeholder, I mean, we had an organizer one. Uh, stakeholder in a flood affected area and we were saying we are doing planning and they say do you have any solution can you do anything because this is two years and nothing has happened so only workshop were organized so such kind of thing and also we also need to think uh, how innovative uh, local people are i mean i i would give an instance i was in a near to a himalayan area no internet no no like a regular service and our car uh, air gone. I mean, I was really worried I would be stuck and won't be able to join it. But then somebody from the school bring the volleyball, like the, the, the pump that put all, uh, air in the volleyball. So we use that pump to fill our uh, tire. You know, that's how we, we had no idea, but they come with such kind of solution and that's how we could to come back, you know. So I think uh, the way I, I I totally agree that we need to think of, and that's how we should treat transformation. And transformation is not something about like a doing very entirely new thing, but it is repurposing. How we repurpose the state of the practice, and I think uh, the, the time we given the time, I feel like uh, we have to think. We have a lot of class learning opportunities, tools, and these are evolving very rapidly. But what is not happening is. We are not uh, reaching the scale, and in, and even that scale, we are not going the speed. We are not matching the speed. I mean, the like Professor Day uh, said, like the policy making process is very slow, but the the rate of changes is very fast. So we are not uh, doing uh, moving in uh, that direction. So. Uh, uh, in that respect, I would like to like uh, maybe I think uh, I think we have discussed a lot uh, very good points here. I don't think we have more. I think we could add more to what has been already raised in one way or other. So if unless uh, you have any if you have any closing point, I mean, basically, I would like to go back to the point of locally led adaptation. This has the eight principle and it I think the one of the idea was how we move the devolve the decision making to the local level. That means the paradigm shift that Sachi has been talking, how we achieve that. Do you think, uh, is, do you see any uh, quick a uh, potential or anything that we can be done quickly? I'm not saying about we need to plan a long-term plan, but maybe within one or two years, is there anything we could uh, hit, I mean, the target? And at least trigger some kind of a uh, transformative potential. So I'd like to, okay, Professor, uh, Professor Day, you have uh, raised your hand. Uh, please feel free. Sorry, I was just thinking, like, is, if it is an open or, or else you can go by order also. I mean, just, no, I, no, no, it's I any, anybody. To, I, I just wanted to uh, say that uh, we have so many important things discussed today, but why still now we need Gobeshana to give us a platform and then we come and then we discuss. <laughs> How can we make it very informal and very interactive and this connectivity should go beyond the political boundaries and there should be, I mean, uh, such provisions in every project to collaborate and to correlate itself. Like very recently we are doing a project in Nepal as well as in Bangladesh and India where we are trying to understand the life cycle of tobacco to reduce tobacco harm. So I was just thinking that how community radio can be very important 
can be very important in using this this type of a uh, message similarly the monitoring and evaluation part like we have to have the funding agencies in in uh, on board and they still uh, struggle with developing the typical monitoring and evaluation things so mm -hmm. let the community the beneficiaries develop the monitoring uh, and evaluation platforms so these type of things has to be very i mean some wild thoughts are needed. I mean, yeah, I, exactly, I simply exactly. feel like that. Out of the box, at random, we'll have to act, like as the climate is acting with us, right? Yes. So we'll have to be that type of uh, crazy type of a thing. Otherwise, it's, it's getting too late. Sorry, I mean, yeah. I just uh, jumped into the thing. Yes, <clears throat> I totally agree. I mean, in Apan, I mean, the sideline, we had a discussion, like funny discussion. Maybe we need to think about capacity building of the donors. Because how yes. this would not fund, yeah. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's uh, very true. So any 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 other reflection? I mean, uh, you can feel feel free. I mean, I will not call you in order, but I mean, if you have anything, just go ahead. Uh, it's Chachi here. I have a feeling maybe we shouldn't wait until next Gobe show, nah? Uh Wherever <laughs> we bumped into each other in either international or regional. A venue or forums, we should connect because about, apparently a lot of like-minded uh, individuals are here also in the audience. I have a suggestion that it's good to keep branching out, sharing your ideas and connect and apply whatever you learn right into the ongoing work at, at your end. Because I learned so much from uh, Sumanji uh, the past two years and I actually applied that point about you know empowering uh, community uh, through the mm, radio broadcast on my own by reaching out to the two uh, community uh, local radios broadcaster by myself. So this is just one tiny example that again we don't have to wait and we should not wait within our capacity uh, within it's already going on in your university in Taiwan University. I'm sure there are lots of research projects you can actually uh, teach your students, graduate students already some principle of uh, indigenous um, data, uh, for example, if you want to embrace it. So my suggestion is that let's not wait. And I totally agree and echo with colleagues that, you know, the more we wait and in action, the cost is higher. Um, and a year is too long uh, not to do anything uh, meaningful toward uh, cl climate action. Thank you, Sachi. So any Absolutely. final thoughts? Uh yeah, I, I just just to echo with Sachi, I'd like to say that uh, we uh, did a project uh, with the support from IGS from International Satyama Partnership Initiative. Uh, in the in the hills, what is happening is due to the microclimate changes, the entire uh, say uh, uh, cycles of the crops these are moving spatially. Some of the crops are take, being taken up in the hills, and the entire, eco, I mean, political ecology is changing in the in the valleys. So I think if we get support from your team, uh, we are doing it in Arunachal, in the eastern part of the Himalayas. So in parts of uh, eastern Bhutan also. So if this type of collaborations can be developed, I mean, uh, like we are civil societies, right? We have very limited resources and very limited capacities in ourselves. But the communities look at with a big, uh, uh, say, uh, hope that something will happen. So if we can collaborate, please, that will be a yeah. blessing for us, in fact. And mm -hmm. Vinay, yeah, we will be all in touch, I think, and let us, yeah, let us coordinate. Totally. Yeah, uh, let's get him let's not forget yeah. APN is always there, you know. Of course, of course. Yeah, I, I really, <laughs> Vinay, I mean, allow hats me. off to Linda. Like, this is really a platform where mm -hmm. we can uh, do amazing work and such a freedom, such a wonderful platform it is. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Dave. Be so, Vinay, Sumanji, yeah. May, may I just take a moment to second everything that has been said by Dr. Day and Dr. Sachi? Especially thanks to Dr. Sachi for involving. She's already started the initiative of involving community radios in her work, which is wonderful. Uh, but you know, I, I I think I'll be the one lamenting most by the fact that I lose touch with the network very quickly because I, speaking very frankly, I do not belong to this network, and therefore I don't get to meet experts like yourself and the others in this panel very often. But um, and therefore I would really I really second the idea support the idea of meeting outside of formal uh, the platforms uh, as as Gobeshana as we have today. 
uh, and I would also like to make a very brief point that you know a lot of lot of times development agencies, whether in the civil society or even UN based development agencies, uh, look at community broadcasters or community media because of their prevalence, because of their per penetration in a, within a country as means of spreading a particular message that takes the color of a project activity, you know, and the, what would really uh, help us uh, go beyond that would be to work with community media, help them come up to speed and involve them in your work so that they become partners and not just uh, agencies that implement the uh, activities connected to a particular project. That's That would be my appeal to all of you really. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure listening to all of you. I learned a lot. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Suman. I really appreciate it. Uh, Professor Swan, if you have anything, final thoughts? Uh... Yeah, I agree with all of you about starting to um, to work together. I mean, right now, and we, I mean, that's um, behind the, the um, main forum. Yes, back home here in, in Vietnam, I am... Um, a partner here in Vietnam, like C4E Craft, Brass for the World. We are working on a big project to develop a climate change learning center in, in Nguyen. And we we develop a climate park here, which aim to um, to demonstrate all the climate change mitigation and adaptation practices. And then it was as a learning hub to able to 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 train or to raise awareness for public and uh, communities here in Vietnam. And I also visit um, the climate change center in Bangladesh to able to, to learn from their experience to able to develop it here in Vietnam. So I, in the future, I really definitely want to work with you all to able to invite you here for, I mean, uh, study, for research, or I mean, uh, co-research, I guess, how we can able to, to challenge the network in the future. Okay, thank you, Professor Son. So I think uh, we are getting close to our time. I mean, it's a very perfect timing, I think. Um, um, so with that, I'd like to uh, ask everybody to provide a big applause to our distinguished panel. Thank you so much. I think now we are close to uh, close to our session. So before that, I'd like to uh, thank and appreciate uh, ICAD team, who is behind the scene uh, doing all the coordination work and uh, providing us this excellent platform to be specifically discuss on locally led adaptation. And also I'd like to thank APN, uh, our colleague Mia San, who has been supporting this, uh, 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 organizing this event and doing background things so that we can concentrate on this discussion. So I'm very much thankful to her. And with uh, to uh, do us to summarize and to provide some way forward. So I would like to invite uh, Dr. Linda and Stevenson, uh, Linda, we, as we know her, to provide uh, some uh, follow-up concluding remarks. So over to you, Linda. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Benaya. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. Um, wow, <laughs> what what a, a great interactive uh, session. And let me just formally close by saying that, you know, as we wrap up this session on Asia-Pacific resilience, empowering local solutions together at the fourth Obishwana Global Conference, I really want to extend my, my heartfelt thanks to, to the organizers, uh, but to our speakers today, uh, and to our participants and to ICAD, of course, for providing the space to promote our locally led adaptation efforts. Um, your active engagement and insightful contributions have made this session extremely meaningful. Uh, but before moving on, I'd like to take just a moment to, to honor the memory of Professor Salim al Haq, his dedication to advocating for local communities, loss and damage, and climate justice um, will continue to inspire us. Uh, I, I believe his legacy will serve as a, as a real guiding light in our effort to address the challenges of climate change, uh, climate change adaptation, particularly in the least developed nations. Throughout our session today, we focused on some of the activities and outputs of locally led adaptation case studies in Vietnam, in Nepal, and in India. And we hope that we can really establish a blueprint for scaling up locally led adaptation efforts. 
we've emphasized the need for targeted capacity building, e-learning, and the utilization of regional organizations like, like us, like APN, like ECMOD, SAFE, and, and AP Platt, to effectively share some of the best practices and use available tools for cross-learning and for scaling out and scaling up locally-led adaptation efforts. In evaluating community resilience, we've focused on aspects, crucial aspects that include food and nutrition security, nature-based solutions, livelihood vulnerability, and climate risk. In this regard, the ongoing monitoring is essential for tracking progress and ensuring the effectiveness of our community resilience initiatives. But what I feel I heard was at the same time, it really has to be both beneficial and valuable to the local communities themselves. Community-based radio broadcasting channels can really significantly help in, in sharing the knowledge, the challenges, the opportunities, and the potential solutions across our local stakeholder communities. So by embracing the principles of locally-led adaptation and exchanging the lessons we've learned today, we can make substantial progress in building resilient communities. And special shout out on this International Women's Day, it's crucial to redouble our efforts in women's meaningful engagement and leadership in adaptation planning, implementation, and decision-making processes. So in closing, I'm really confident that our collective efforts are out of the box thinking and our discussions on these paradigm shifts will contribute meaningfully to the goals of the fourth Gobishona Global Conference. But I think I echo um, everyone's thoughts when I say, let's not wait until next year to share our ideas, to collaborate more and to take significant action. With that, thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. Thank you very much. Let's thank you all for joining this session. Everybody, we close this. Uh, session. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Good night. Good evening. Take Bye -bye. care, everyone. Have Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.